High Voltage takes center stage in this brand new season of Hitachi Energy's Power Pulse podcast. We promise to bring you great content from the brightest minds in the business. We'll discuss challenges, opportunities, and all the hot topics any high voltage enthusiast, or anyone interested in sustainability for that matter, is sure to enjoy. In the first episode of the podcast, we want to give you a flavor of the topics we'll cover throughout the season. We needed someone with a deep knowledge of the power grid in all its glory, inside out, to really tell the story. So who better than the managing director of the High Voltage Business Unit himself? Dr. Marcus Heimbach holds an MSc and a PhD in Electrical Engineering from Aachen University and an MBA from the University of Hagen. Before joining our company, he was a scientist and a chief engineer at Aachen University. We should add that he was also the MD for Median Voltage and later the Transformers Business Unit. You get the gist of why we picked him for this episode, right? His range of knowledge in this field is pretty incredible. Welcome to Power Pulse. This season, we explore the world of high voltage. I'm your host, Sam Dash, and for our first episode, I'm speaking with none other than Marcus Heimbach, Managing Director for High Voltage Products. Hi, Marcus. Hello. So, Marcus, first things first, I hear you are a keen cyclist. Do you race or take part in events? It is correct that I'm a cycler, that I'm as well doing it mainly because I enjoy it yeah. and as well because to to keep the shape. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but for sure, from time to time, I'm going to events like the Bodensee Bike Marathon okay. or the Lake Constance Bike Marathon in yeah. English. And by the way, the day after tomorrow, I'm trying the Amstel Gold Race oh close God. to my hometown. Oh, wow. And so what does that consist of? How long is that? 150 kilometers. So mm-hmm. it depends how fast you are. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I hope that I will go through it with an average of a bit more than 20 kilometers per hour. Wow, fast. I suddenly have this image of you in an office on a stationary bike powering the whole office building with your energy. (laughs) Yeah, the the problem is that the human being is not the most efficient way of (laughs) of, of generating this electricity. So you do it maybe for fun, but I don't think it's really efficient to do it (laughs) to power the houses. Yeah. So Marcus, before we dive in, I'd love for you to help us with some definitions. The term energy transition is a term I've heard used a bit here and there. Can you give our listeners and me, for that matter, an overview of what energy transition means in general terms and then specifically for high voltage? Sure. The term energy transition is a translation of the German word Energiewende. Mm -hmm. And the Energiewende started after the Fukushima event. When the German government decided to shut down all the nuclear power plants within a certain time period. In response to Fukushima. In response to Fukushima because of all the safety and environmental topics. Right. Which were resulting out of it. Yeah. And while they were doing it, you need as well to replace this energy, which is generated by the nuclear power plants, by something else. And the idea was to replace it by renewables. Mm -hmm. And then when through the Kyoto Protocol and other things, the pressure on the decarbonization came more and more, the energy transition term was as well used and more and more used for the overall decarbonization where the whole world is embarking on. I see. So everyone joined in on that effort. Everybody is joining in on that effort and it's meaning that we are trying to replace the traditional, mainly fossil fueled power plants, Uh but as well the nucleus, by renewables. Right. And this is then driving decarbonization of the generation. On the other hand, it is not only the generation which needs to be decarbonized, it's as well the consumption. Right. When you, for example, look into the cars... A combustion engine Mm -hmm. is as well as a carbon footprint. And this is more and more replaced by the electrical vehicles. Yeah. When you look into fossil heating, like gas heating or oil heating, the idea going forward is more and more to use heat pumps. Right. All of this is putting additional load into the grid. And so energy transition exists in a multitude of different contexts, is what you're saying, right? It exists in multiple contexts. For us, it means that the whole world is becoming more electric. Right. Which for us as high voltage products or as Hitachi Energy means that the grid needs to be more and more enlarged. Right. The grid needs to be stronger because there is more electrical energy transmitted because of the overall load increase, but as well because the load is shifting from other things into electrical loads. 
So from that point of view, you need a grid which is becoming stronger, meaning has more capacity, is extremely reliable with now less stable generation. Mm -hmm. Because when you look into, for example, into a nuclear power plant, it is an extremely stable generation like a coal power plant. You know exactly what electricity you are generating. Mm -hmm. While when you look into a renewable, you have the fluctuation. Right. You don't know if the wind is blowing for the turbines. You don't know if the sun is shining for the solar. Right. You need to have some forecastability. It means also that the grip is not only needs to become stronger, it needs as well to become more smarter, more intelligent, more flexible, because you need to react to the different sources you have. And the grid is there to match between the consumption and the generation. And this needs as well to be controlled to the grid through the digitalization. And last but not least, you need as well to make the grid as well, which is an enabler, as I explained, mm -hmm. for the green world, for the decarbonized world. Mm -hmm. But the grid itself needs to become more greener. Mm -hmm. And this I'm going to explain in one of the later discussions we have. Great. So Marcus, why do we need high voltage? It's very simple. The higher the voltage, the lower the losses. If you, for example, have a normal distribution, like here in this building, you have 230 or 400 volts. And when you are here in Europe, the highest transmission voltage is in the range of 400 kV. So there is a factor of 1000 in between. However, if you transmit the same power at 400 kV and at 400 volt, mm -hmm. you make out of the factor 1000, which you need to invest into the voltage, a reduction of the losses by 1 million, 1000 to the power of 2. Because the higher the voltage, the lower the current in order to transmit the same amount of power. I see. So it's about efficiency, more or less. Is that right? It's about efficiency. You want that most of the power you are generating in the power plant or in the solar plant or on, mm -hmm. the, on the wind turbines, that most of the power reaches the consumer. With as little loss as possible. With as little loss as possible. On that journey. Which is as well a part of the decommunization of the network. Right. And for that, it is absolutely mandatory to increase the voltage because with 400 volt, you will basically, if you transmit with this, you will only create losses. Right. So pivoting a little bit in terms of the history of the power grid, I'd love for you to explain for our listeners, the geography of the grid, the infrastructure system that powers our homes and businesses. Yeah. The grid itself, as I mentioned before, is the connection between the, the generation and the consumer and the consumer is a, the powers and in the houses. Yeah. And during the discussion just a bit before, I explained why we need the high voltage. Mm -hmm. And that is already the answer about a part of the geography, meaning we transmit the big power, the bulk power over long distance with as a high as possible voltage. Mm -hmm. And those are the power lines that people see sort of dotting the landscape. These are the huge power lines that the people see in the landscape. As mentioned, the main transmission here in Europe is done at 400 kilovolt. Right. And when you have these 400 kilovolts, and this is, I've just told you the, the good thing about it, the losses. But on the other hand, it's a huge effort to put the system from 400 volt into 400,000 volt because you need a lot of insulation. You need a lot of distances. You need a lot of investment as well mm -hmm. to generate that grid. Right. Yeah. Or to create that grid. Yeah. And this is one for the long distances. And then we are approaching more and more other cities. And when you come to the city, you have less space. Right. By the way, this is one of the reasons why we invented at, in Tachi Energy the gas insulated switchgear, which is a very compact size into the cities. So it's ideal for urban areas where you don't have as much space Correct. to use. Yeah. It's, it's ideal for that one. And when you go into the cities as well, you have lower distances mm -hmm. and you cannot afford to go always with 400 kilovolt or up to 400,000 volt to the cities. Right, because safety is also safety an issue. Safety is an issue, space is an issue. You need to go down with the voltage in order to overcome that disadvantage what the high voltage has. The more and more you go then into the rural area or into the streets, you go down to medium voltage mm -hmm. until it enters into the household at 400 or 230 volts. Right, at a much safer speed. I would not say it's as safer, but in a much more handable speed, uh, because right. in the end of the day, it's as well a lot of space. Yeah. You would waste if you put only small currents on a 400 kV. Sure. Yeah. So getting a little bit more into the history, 
How old is the power grid in general? Or does that differ, I guess, depending on the country and the region? For sure, it depends on the country and the region, but it is roughly in the end of the 19th century it started, when they started to to transmit energy from one point to an, to another point. It was not really a grid in the beginning, it was more a point-to-point uh, point point direction. But in the end of the day, that was the topic. And there was a big debate if the discussion would be between an alternating current or between a, a direct current. So AC, what we say, or DC. And there was a lot of fights and history at that time. The alternating current, the AC, was winning the game because of the more flexibility you have with the AC. And when you mean flexibility, it means that the AC and the transformer principle is to change from voltages, from different voltage levels, you need a transformer. Mm -hmm. And this is coming along with the alternating current because you are not able to do a transformer when you do it in direct current or in DC. And there's another topic is when you talk about an AC network, you can have as well circuit breakers. Right. Because with 50 hertz, the current crosses the zero line 100 times mm -hmm. in a second. Mm -hmm. And you only are able in an efficient way and in a smart way to interrupt the current if you take it at the current zero. Right, that makes sense. And that is basically the principle why the alternating current was winning the game in the past. Mm -hmm. Because you can apply the transformer and you can as a main safety element use as well the circuit breaker. So is direct current still used? Direct current is now coming back. And uh, I would say bigger than ever or larger than ever. Oh, interesting. And the reason is that whenever you transmit a direct current, energy of always a direct current, you don't have reactive power. Why is that? Because, and this is a little bit technical now, sure, because yeah. a transmission line behaves somehow as well as a capacitor. And... A capacitor means that you are charging a capacitor and you as well unloading it. Okay. Which is not a big problem, but it's a problem because this current overlays the current which is used in order to transmit the power. Right, right. And this current is then in the transmission system creating an additional loss. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah? yeah. When you have, for example, a cable which behaves even more than as a capacitor than a transmission line. Yeah. You are with a couple of 10 kilometers, you are only charging the cable any longer and you cannot transmit anything. Okay. And when you think about now all the wind farms, which are now coming into the North Sea, which are coming around the coast of China yeah. in the US East and Western coast, these wind farms are a couple of 10 kilometers away from the coast. Yeah. So, and if you would transmit this power generated at the wind farm at AC, you would only charge the cable. Right. So that's why it is more efficient, mm -hmm. for example, to, to adapt or to use the direct current in order to transmit that energy onto the shore. So how did different countries end up having different voltage requirements for their power grid? It's always a lot about history. Yeah. And it's about distances. Mm -hmm. For example, Europe is, is big from a population point of view, but it's not the largest from a distance point of view. When you look into US and when you look into China and as well partly in India, they are using more distance, higher. They need to transmit over longer lines. And this, you can easily say, the more energy you need to transmit over longer distances, mm -hmm. the more efficient it is to use higher voltages. Right, because it has farther to go. It has farther to go. And as I mentioned, the loss is the lower, the higher the voltages. Right. But this doesn't come for free, as I mentioned too. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah? It takes a lot of resources yeah. and thought. So I imagine this is connected, but can you explain why some countries have 50 hertz and others 60 hertz? You sort of touched on this a little bit earlier. The, the reason is in the beginning, there were a lot of frequency used. Mm -hmm. And there are two competing things. Yeah. The one is that a transformer is needing less iron mm -hmm. for the core and mm -hmm. is much less from a weight point of view and much cheaper, uh -huh. the higher the frequency is. The higher the frequency, mm -hmm. the lower is the capex or the weight mm -hmm. or the effort you need to put in the transformer because right. the transformer is generating the voltage to the changing current. And the higher the rate of change, the rate of rise or whatever, yeah. the more voltage is generated. So you need less iron in order to, to conduct the magnetic flux. I see. Right. And you have a very prominent example for that one, which is the yeah. aircraft industry. Yeah. When you have 
the board nets of the aircraft, mm -hmm. it is much more important that you have less weight compared to the efficiency of the system. Uh -huh. You go with 400 hertz just to reduce the, the weight of the transformer. Right. On the other hand, you want to have a generation, a generator or whatever, who is not always to be too fast in turning or whatever. Why is that? Because the faster it, the rotating, and in the beginning it was more on a hydropower plants, mm -hmm. then it's much more effort you need to control the speed and the rotating uh, speed. Right. So from that point of view, it was even more interesting on the former generation side to have lower voltages. Right. And then they came to a compromise and the compromise somehow here in Europe is a 50 hertz. In the US, it is, or the North America is 60 hertz. And then you spread it out. So Saudi Arabia adapted to the US is 60 hertz. And Japan, which is very interesting, was on the one hand side with GE, which is 60 hertz. And on the other side with Siemens, it is 50 hertz. So you have then basically the full history going around the world. Do you think everyone will ever get on the same page? No, no. I don't think so. Because <laughs> what will happen more and more is, as we said, that more we have more DC. Yeah. And that we have more power electronics uh -huh. in the network, which are as well able then to couple the different networks with HVDC connections so that it is not so important if it is 50 or 60 hertz on the one side, on the other side. The compatibility sort of becomes negligible, more or less. Correct. Yeah. And just to mention one thing, which is unfortunately um, interesting, but not a good news, is uh -huh. the 50 and the 60 hertz is unfortunately in the range where the heart is the most vulnerable. Explain that to me. I don't, I, I miss the English word when you come with 50 or 60 hertz, or you can, you can test how much, how well a human being or can anybody withstand a voltage at a different frequency. Oh, I see. Okay. And the, the withstand capability of mm -hmm. the human body. Yeah is unfortunately the weakest at the 50 and the 60 hertz because it is impacting the rhythm of the heart. Oh, interesting. So you get this way that you have extremely high frequency in the heart and mm -hmm. that is unfortunately not helping the overall system. So we need to be even more careful when we are handling our system with the 50 hertz and the 60 hertz. You mentioned digitalization earlier. We live in an ever-evolving digital world. How is high voltage keeping up with the times from a digital perspective? For so the digital has, as high voltage has a lot of dimensions for us. Mm -hmm. One example I would have from a uh, production operations point of view is what we call the digital passport, where we are now able to trace all the products, all the components, all the suppliers within the digital passport system. And when we go into the, the field later on, when we have a, a circuit breaker installed three years later, we go back there, we can through a barcode understand or QR code, mm -hmm. we can understand the full history of that breaker. Right. We know what material was used. We know who was the supplier. We know what was the torque applied. We know how it performed during the routine testing. That we will know, which is a huge effort and which will be impacting the reliability of our products. Sort of provides a um, sort of digital encyclopedia for all these different components. Correct. Is that right? As we say, uh, exactly. As we applied uh, um, for our, we call it passport. It's in the end of the day, you know exactly what was done there. This yeah. is one example for the digitalization. Another yeah. example is that we have, for example, controlled switching or point of wave switching. A circuit breaker needs to hit the, the current zero mm -hmm. in order to switch the current. Yeah. The circuit breaker is a mechanical system. The interruption is done by the arc, uh -huh. but it depends very much when the arc is starting, how far away is it from the next current zero. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this new, you can understand this is a very high mechanical topic, yeah. but it's as well an electrical and digital topic to forecast the next current zero. So this is where we use as well uh, digitalization because when you know when the next current zero is coming, you need much less effort or you are switching on the one hand or you are switching much safer than you do with the normal switching. And another example, for example, is our installed base mm -hmm. is our predictive maintenance. We know through the digital thing is if the gas is leaking, what is the decomposition of the gas. And we can as well through digitalization predict the lifetime of the equipment. But we as well know when the service people need to go there and they look at the equipment in order to prolong the lifetime or in order to make sure that the equipment is safe. 
And part of the current discussion around digitalization is the use of AI. Do you see the use of AI coming into the world of high voltage? It is coming for sure into the world of energy. Mm -hmm. It is as well coming into high voltage. The topic is that our equipment mainly is only operating when there's a short circuit and, and these things. So to, to predict the maintenance of this equipment, you need to have not too many possibilities to take the data from in order to predict the future behavior. Right. But for sure, this is a, is a future and this is a dream for all of us. Got it. Now, going back to the grid, how often does equipment in the power grid need to be replaced? That depends a lot, but usually we are creating and we are building equipment mm -hmm. which is reliable mm -hmm. and which is there to remain for decades. I would say after 30 to 40 years, even 50 years, and maybe in an extreme case, even to 60 years, I saw that once or twice. However, it is as well that the technology might change or that you are looking into a substation or into a transmission line mm -hmm which needs now to fulfill different demands. Right. Maybe you have more consumer and you need to upgrade the transmission line or the substation from 200 kV to 400 kV. Then you need to replace it. But from the overall topic point of view, I would say you can say that the, the lifetime is in the range of some 40 years. And do you see the possibility of making these grids more sustainable from your viewpoint? Is that something that's feasible? That is exactly the topic where I was referring to in the first question. We need as well to have a greener grid. We are using in the high voltage uh, a beautiful gas from a technology point of view, which is called SF6, mm -hmm. sulfur hexafluoride, which is the best gas you can imagine when it comes to insulation and when it comes to interruption. As I mentioned, we need as well the circuit breaker to interrupt the current, especially the, the fault current or right. the short circuit current. And when you interrupt the current, you need a gas which is cooling down the arc. The interruption is being done by an arc. Mm -hmm. And you need to have a gas which is cooling down the arc as fast as possible in order to withstand the voltage after the current zero. Yeah, right. And this gas, on the other hand, so beautiful from a technology point of view, has a huge advantage. It's the most potent greenhouse gas we know. It has a global warming potential of 25,000, meaning 25,000 times CO2. And when you look into that one, it means that every leakage we have, and leakages you have natural leakage, you have as well maybe in the process you have a problem, mm -hmm. every leakage is creating somehow an environmental case. Yeah, a detriment to the planet. Yes. Yeah. And that's why our industry has the obligation to get rid of the SF6. Right. And we are now doing this one in order to replace the SF6, we call it iconic, in order to have an SF6-free gas gas mixture to be uh, to be more precise mm -hmm. which is then having the same reliability but you need this a much better environmental behavior but as well the complete scalability from maybe from 10 kv up to 400 kv or 1000 kv as sf6 had so you've sort of touched on this already but where do you see the future of replacing sf6 going I see the future of SF6. We have a lot of jurisdictions in, around the world. And for example, in Europe, in North America, I expect within the next decade that the input of SF6 into the new system through new equipment will be basically banned. Right. So you will have SF6 free solutions like our Iconic solution, mm -hmm. which is then doing the same job, but with a little bit more effort. The reliability is there. The scalability is there without having the harm on the environment. Right. But still, you still have a lot of equipment in the network. As we said, it's some 40 years. Mm -hmm. So if it, we are phasing out, you have equipment which is staying then for another 30 years after the phase out. And we need as well to think what we can do about that one. And here our idea is, or what we have already tested, is that we take the SF6 out of there and, and replace it by an eco-efficient gas. So using the same equipment, you take the SF6 out of the equation and replace it. Correct. Yeah. So because also this, it's not only the decarbonization is not only with the new equipment, it is as well with the existing and the installed base, which we need to attack. Right. Thanks so much for joining us today, Marcus. You've provided a really robust foundation for our listeners and for me. Thanks so much for tuning in to this first episode of Power Pulse, our season on high voltage. Until next time. And that's it for today. We'll be back soon with some more great content. 
But before you go, remember to give us a follow so you don't miss an episode. Thanks for tuning in. See you soon. This episode was brought to you by Hitachi Energy. Created and introduced by Barbara Freitas Daniels. Content and script writing by Cassandra Inne. Guest speaker, Dr. Markus Heimbach. Hosted by Sam Dash. Produced and edited by Creative Chimps.